Ladies and gentlemen, I now invite Dr. Matthew Messelson to deliver the convocation address. Dr. Matt Me Messelson. I am honored to be here before you today on this important occasion at McGill, one of the preeminent universities of the world. You young science graduates are fortunate to be entering science at a time of great discovery in many fields. Fortunate also because as scientists, you will enter a worldwide fellowship dedicated to the pursuit of knowledge, bringing you friends not only nearby, but all over the world. I too was fortunate to have entered science at a time of great discovery in biology. A central problem then was to discover the physical basis of heredity. How can the ordinary elements be put together in molecules capable of being replicated? There had previously been two great waves of advance in understanding heredity. The first wave began 113 years ago. That was when Gregor Mendel's paper, although published in a widely accessible journal, reprints sent to a large number of biologists but ignored for 35 years, was at last recognized in 1900. Mendel's beautiful experiments with garden peas showed that the units of heredity do not blend. Before that, it was thought that when you make a cross, the parental contributions blend like mixing two paints of different color. Blending implied that a beneficial new variation arising in an individual would be diluted out after several generations to the point where the benefit would be diluted away to nothing. The erroneous belief in blending inheritance created a great problem for the theory of evolution by natural selection. If variations blend, rare beneficial variants could never get a foothold in a population. Mendel's discoveries not only cleared the way for the correct development of evolution theory, they also set off a flood of genetic research which, combined with the growing understanding of the behavior of chromosomes, gave us the classical theory of genetics. This was a far-reaching synthesis, explaining many of the phenomena of heredity in terms of behavior of chromosomes. By 1950, when I was an undergraduate, classical genetics, including the idea that individual genes specify individual proteins, was essentially complete, in the sense that a textbook published then could still be used as an excellent basis for a university course today. The second great wave of advance in understanding heredity was the rise of molecular biology, resting on structural chemistry and biochemistry. And here I want to interject a completely different thought. There are really two kinds of heredity. There's the kind that's contained in our sequences of DNA. There's the other kind that's maintained, preserved, and propagated by universities. That's the heredity of culture. I don't agree with the single thought that university education should simply teach us how to think critically. It should do that, of course. But it has the responsibility as really the only organ in societies that maintains, adds a little bit, and passes on the enormous heredity that has gathered, so far as we know, for at least 5,000 years in human writings, speech, song, dance, and so on. So now back to biology. Molecular biology got going with the proposal of the double helical structure of DNA by Watson and Crick in 1953, as you know. Knowing the molecular structure of a protein or a lipid or a carbohydrate molecule doesn't tell you what to do, doesn't tell you much. But the structure of DNA set the research agenda for the next quarter century. The structure itself literally dictated what needed to be done. It says, here I am, a long sequence of four different kinds of subunits, ATGC. And knowing that genes specify proteins, go figure out how my four-letter language is decoded into the 20 amino acid language of proteins. Or here I am, confined to the cell nucleus, 
but proteins are made out in the cytoplasm. So there must be an intermediate copy of my information that goes from the nucleus to the cytoplasm. Go find it, the messenger. This is DNA telling you what to do. Can you imagine a lipid molecule telling you what to do? Or here I am, the substance of genes. Genes recombine in meiosis. Go figure out how that happens. Or here I am, I mutate. Damage in me is repaired. I am folded into chromosomes. Go find out how these things are done. Of course, it's a very big agenda. And it's dictated, like the Wizard of Oz, except this was no fraud, by a molecule. And of course, from the start, the double helix said, here I am with two complementary chains. Go figure out how this complementarity is used to make copies of myself. I first heard about the double helix in the course of being kicked out of the office of Max Delbruck, a physicist turned biologist and a founder of molecular biology. This was at Caltech, where I was a graduate student of Linus Pauling in chemistry during X-ray crystallography in order to learn the principles of molecular structure and then enter biology. Delbrick was in the biology division at that time, rather isolated from the chemists, and he had a fearsome reputation. Eventually, I got up my courage and went to see Delbrick to get his advice about how a young chemist could get into biology. Delbrick responded by asking me what I thought of the two papers Watson and Crick had published in Nature a few months earlier. I said I'd never heard of them. Thereupon, Max reached for a heap of reprints of the two papers he had on a shelf behind his desk and threw them at me, saying, get out and don't come back until you've read them. What I heard was come back. <laughs> when I did go back, Delbrick talked about the unwinding problem. He thought it hydrodynamically impossible to unwind a long double helix to separate the two chains so they could each act as templates to copy new chains. He was right. So he quite reasonably concluded that the chains have to be broken to get them apart. That's right, too. But no one knew then about topoisomerases and the fact that all the breaks they make are then healed, preserving the separate integrity of the individual chains. At that time, there were three different ideas about how DNA might replicate, and a fourth possibility that I think no one talked about then. Each idea made a different prediction for how the DNA in a parental double helix would be distributed in its progeny. First, semi-conservatively, following the suggestion of Watson and Crick. Second, dispersively, as Delbrook suggested, breaking up the chains so that lengths of old chains would be joined to lengths of new chains in the progeny. Third, conservatively, with the two chains of the double helix never having come apart, remaining together generation after generation, and somehow stamping out new double helices. And then finally, which I think we didn't talk about then, is destructively, in which nothing is left of the parent chains. Talking with Delbrick made me think of an idea I had for another problem involving enzyme induction. The idea was to separate macromolecules according to density in an altered centrifuge. You probably know of the experiment that Frank Stahl and I did in 1957, published the following year, that showed very graphically that DNA replicates semi-conservatively. The parental chains separate and remain intact, each now paired with a new chain. There isn't time to tell you about how after two years of problems and glitches, we got the experiment to work, showing the sharp bands that unambiguously showed that DNA replicates semi-conservatively. Even before that, Delbrick and a few others, mostly fellow members of the so-called phage group, thought the double helix was too elegant to be wrong. But there were lots of other people who thought it was too simple to be right. After all, isn't biology very complicated and even mysterious? What our demonstration of semi-conservative replication did, I think, was to make the double helix real when previously, to many, it was just a beautiful hypothesis based mainly on building molecular models, like Pauling's alpha helix a few years before. It remained to be proved. After semi-conservative replication, we and others went on to apply the density gradient method to several other problems, the molecular basis of genetic recombination, DNA mismatch repair, messenger RNA, restriction enzymes, and other problems. 
After that, I became interested in a fundamental biological problem that is still unsolved, the evolutionary problem of why species that abandon sexual reproduction go extinct. We are also working on another fundamental unsolved problem in biology, what drives the aging process. So there are lots of really fundamental problems left to say nothing about the human brain. A major change in biological research since the rise of molecular biology has been the advent of what's called big data and projects involving the partition, participation of many, even hundreds, maybe someday thousands of scientists. Current examples are the Human Genome Project, of course, and the big new human brain projects in the European Union to build a supercomputer to emulate the human brain, and in the United States to map all the connections to the 86 million neurons in our brains. Still, I expect that as in the past, many of the major advances will come from individuals or small groups. But whether you work in a small group or a big one, with small data or big data, you are fortunate to be starting just now. Now I've added one more sentence while sitting here. I read in a translation of the Roman philosopher Epictetus that although we are all bound together as members of a society, take some time to think about what kind of life you want to leave and what kind of life you want to live and what kind of person you want to be. I wish you the best. <laughs>